What happens when you put two Hmong women BCBAs on the same podcast episode? Lots of great content that will hopefully start a movement. Join me as I chat with Mary Moa about bringing cultural responsiveness to the table and how we can impact change by embracing autism more in us. Hello, welcome to the Let's Talk About Autism in Monglish podcast. For today's podcast episode, I will continue the ABA career profile. I started with number one, the RBT, because that's who you'll um, meet first. Well, after you meet the BCBA, you'll meet the RBT. That's your first point of contact. And then my second career profile was the BCBA candidate. That is the individual that is was an RBT, um, felt so inspired, wanted to become a BCBA. And then on today's episode, I will be talking to, um, in part three of the ABA career profile, I'll be talking to a BCBA. Um, and I am so honored to bring onto the show my colleague, Mary Moore, who I randomly, I think she found me or we found each other, I don't know, about two years ago on, um, I don't remember what, a Facebook page it was, but someone said autism and ABA. And I think Mary and I both her radar went Oop! and we saw it and we kind of met, messaged each other and um, kind of uh, got to talking and realized that we both wanted to do the same thing for our phone community, which is bring ABA um, out into the open to talk and share with our Hmong community and also bring autism awareness. And initially our goal was just to disseminate information. So, um, welcome to the podcast, Mary. Thank you so much, Tia. Thank you for having me. And I am, you know, so honored to also be here, um, today to just share and disseminate information, but just share about my journey and, you know, share about the profile. Yeah, so I don't know that we, you and I have even had this conversation. I know we've known each other for two years. Well, actually, full disclosure, everybody, Mary and I haven't met in person because that's just how life is these days. You meet people and you know them for many, many years, but you just never meet them. But then you're like doing all these amazing things together. So um, there's so many more things that I I have to learn about you. So that first thing I would like to ask you then is what brought you to the field of ABA? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, I want to say, you know, chance, right? I think, you know, sometimes in life things happen for a reason or things just, you know, is there by chance. And I, I want to say, I think by chance, um, you know, I stumbled upon the field of ABA. I was in college. Um, and one of my professor, actually, um, a mentor and a professor was um, a supervisor at a local um, ABA agency. Um, and she knew that I was, you know, looking for a job. And she kind of was just like, hey, um, you know, there's, you know, there's a job that you might be interested in. Um, they're called, you know, behavior and they're called behavior therapists at that time. Um, and they're very flexible, right? Um, you can still go to school. It's kind of, you know, based on your schedule. Um, and at first I was like, okay, I'll think about it. I didn't really look into it. Um, and then I was like, you know, maybe I'll give it a try, right? And she's my mentor. She's my professor. Um, you know, let me look into it. And so I applied. Um, I applied and then I got accepted and to the position, I got an offer and I took it and I kind of just, you know, I just started my career from there. And so I want to say by chance, um, but probably, you know, um, maybe, you know, maybe um, there was something out there for me, right? Maybe it was my calling. I, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm here now. I'm here. I was there then. I'm here still. And I, you know, here for, for the long haul. <laughs> Right. So you were in college? I was. Right? I was in college. Like yeah. what what year? Oh my goodness. I don't remember what year I was. Um, I want to say maybe my second year in college. Okay. Oh, my second year in college. Yeah. Yeah. So you got the job and then like, what made you, what did you love about it? What made you go, oh, this is something I want to pursue my graduate degree in? Yeah. So honestly, it wasn't my field of interest, right? Um, it was just a job at that time. 
um, you know, I was preparing for, for several different other, you know, um, career paths. Um, you know, I was looking into teaching, um, growing up, I've always like wanted to be a teacher. Um, but then I was really interested in criminology, um, and I, criminology is that I have a minor in criminology. And so I was then looking into law school, um, at that time, my husband, you know, worked, um, you know, at the, um, at the DA's office. Um, and so I did my internship there. One of my professor was a judge at our, you know, local um, jurisdiction court. And so, you know, like I was looking into law school. So um, that was in my first career, you know, path. It was just like, I'm going to take this job. I'm going to see. And then of course, you know, things happen, right? Um, I think I'm naturally drawn to the fact that, you know, I'm making a difference, um, a difference in, in a different way. Um, I think when I first started, um, you know, I think, as you know, in, in our it, culturally, right, it's it's a sensitive topic when you talk about disability. Um, I remember sharing about, you know, being in this field and working with individuals with autism or individuals with disability. Um, and I would get reactions like, you know, oh, min it's so hello, you know, do bo, right? Or like, oh, you know, go they go, right? You know, things like that, like questions like, oh, why are you working there? Like, why would you work with them? Or, you know, child, it's so hello, you know, like there's so many things. And, um, I was always like, you know, like I shrugged it off. And then sometimes like, you know, like when you're downtime, you're thinking, you know, why would they say that, you know, or things like that. But I think, you know, perhaps those small comments maybe, you know, motivated me more, right? Maybe heightened my interest in the field more. But I think naturally when you work with families, you you see the impact that you make, right? Like when, you know, when I remember working with my first client and, um, you know, my, my client had some behaviors, my client, you know, um, made physical contact with me, um, and it left me bleeding. And, um, but even though it left me bleeding, my client came and was like, you know, a boo-boo and got me, you know, a band-aid and to put it on my, to put it on me, you know? And so it's like, wow. Um, you know, and, it, and it's in those moments, I think, that, you know, matters, right? Um, and how, um, and, and it's those little things. And so I think, you know, all of those little things just continue to um, motivate me to just stay in the field. Um, aside from that, um, I think, I think there is a big need in our Hmong community. Um, and so part of that is I see as I continue the field, I realize um, the lack of information that might be disseminated. I see um, the need um, of having to maybe be sensitized to, um, you know, disability, to autism, um, to services, right? Um, I see that, you know, in general, when when we have somebody that, you know, have a disability, um, oftentimes people default to like social security income or, you know, like a, other source of, of, of help um, and services, but not necessarily like services that might potentially make a, a deeper impact. I, um, like APA or um, treatment services or getting a service provider. Um, and so I think part of that also is I, as I'm working in the field, um, you know, having just that passion of, you know, wanting to make a difference and wanting to show our community that one, you know, like we can be practitioners and we can be service providers and we can make a difference. Um, but then also too, that you know, acknowledging that we do have a need in our community and that, you know, we should seek these services and these services, that we are entitled to these services as well, right? Um, and so I think, you know, like there's just so many different angles, so many things to think about, um, but I think all of those things, you know, keep the excitement, right, and it keeps me going um, because there's just so much, there's just so much to do. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's such a big need out there. Yeah, definitely. I will circle back to this, but I do want to say when you mentioned in the beginning that you have a minor in criminology, it's funny because I was just looking at some 
job postings and some people were saying, oh, I'm a BCBA and I work for the FBI. So you mm-hmm. definitely could have gone into that, right? So those yeah. two fields could have definitely merged. So, you know, this is a career profile. And I just want to let, um, you know, young professionals or college students out there know, like, if you go into this and you're like, you know, I don't want to work with the autism population, you could do other things, right? You can work with the FBI. You could, um, OBM is my heart and soul, but I, I don't know. I feel like I'll do that one day when I retired. And I'm like, I still want to use my skills. So I know that's really interesting. Um, I feel like they should do more outreach in college, yeah. in undergraduate. You know, like you guys, be, I'm, being a BCBA or ABA is not just for, you know, the autism population. It's for a lot of things. It's for life. So, nice. yeah, thanks for sharing that experience. Um, yes. And, and one of the reasons... Mm-hmm. I'm actually glad that you brought that up because, you know, that was kind of, I love Criminal Minds, right? And mm-hmm. so growing up, that's what I watch and I've always- Oh, the show? Me. Yes. And I, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, the, you know, the behavior profile, right? Um, looking mm-hmm. at that. And so like in my, you know, if I could one day, right, I don't know, reincarnate or be born again or my, maybe in my first life or my next life or so, you know, maybe <laughs> go into that field, right? You or know? in retirement, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like in retirement, you could be a BCBA who does that. Yes. Stuff. You're like the cool grandma that comes in and does all this stuff. <laughs> yes. You know, but yeah. So. But absolutely, you know, criminology, you know, ABA, I just happen to fall into, you know, working with children with autism, um, not just autism, right? But, you know, I've worked for you, residential group homes, you know, um, residential day facilities, um, you know, adults, you know, and, you know, um, early intervention and things like that but you know like absolutely like ab is applicable to like any field so like you know the fda yes. behavior profile just like you mentioned you know obm mm-hmm. things like that yeah so you um remind me again was this experience in initially um in the aba field was it in california or wisconsin it's in california at that time. california okay and then afterwards um, once you became a BCBA, you guys were in the Wisconsin area. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, the Hmong population that you probably had more experience with, um, just because based on where you live, right? Because like for me as a clinician, I lived in the Midwest, well, also the Midwest, but it, I, which more Hmong uh, families. And in fact, in the last five years, I finally had my first Hmong family like this year, you know? And so, um, it's been a long time and it, and I didn't, I wasn't sure how that would, what that experience would be like, you know, cause we talk about, you know, when you work with Hmong families, hey, you're Hmong, it's a little different. You would hope that it's better as a clinician because um they look like you you look like them actually and vice versa really um so do you feel like you know um with considering your experience that you've had working with Hmong families uh what are some of the similarities and then what are some of the differences when you work with the Hmong families versus Jamaica families or the Hispanic families or the black families I think some of the similarities, right, that we have with Hmong families or individuals of colors, I want to say, is one of the biggest factors is, you know, culturally responsive treatment. Um, I think that, you know, it's it's hard, right? Because some of our families is, you know, they're, they're seeking services for their first time, right? Maybe they've had these concerns for a while, um, and maybe they've expressed these concerns. But as we know, research shows that individuals that are bilingual usually get a you know a later diagno- diagnostic, right? Like a later diagnosis. And so, you know, maybe they have had these concerns for a long time, but now maybe four or five years later, they're finally getting services. Um, and you know, and and so when you have a family that you know maybe is seeking services at a later time. I think sometimes as practitioners, um, as practitioners, I think we come from a different lens, right? We come in there and we're like, hey, I want to help your child, you know, like, you know, maybe based on your studies, depending on, you know, how you deliver services. Sometimes these can be really black and white, maybe not thinking in the forefront, you know, what do I do or how do I work with this family to ensure that they're comfortable, to ensure that they feel respected, right? To ensure that maybe I'm meeting their needs um, or to even take into consideration maybe their history, right? We talk about ABA, we talk about our learned history reinforcement, right? Like, you know, 
allowing them to get contact into reinforcement first, or, you know, even thinking about considering their learned history of reinforcement. I think sometimes services, service providers go in like too strong. Um, so in terms of some of the differences. What do you that, mean by they go in too strong? Um, you know, with, with recommendations or, um, you know, maybe things um, with, with recommendations, with programming, um, with their own biases, right? Sometimes their own biases, we see that quite often, um, you know, um, their own personal biases. Can you give me an example of what the uh, personal biases might mean? Yeah. So, you know, um, personal biases might, for example, um, maybe if you're working with um, a long family or a family, you know, of a family of color that maybe lives in a lower socioeconomic status, you know, area, right, with lower um, SES, maybe they might treat them a little differently versus maybe if you are working with, you know, maybe another family that perhaps their parents are, I don't know, scientists or medical doctors, right, how you might treat them differently. Um, and I just had that recently and I had a discussion with a practitioner um, that, you know, I was overseeing um, and they were making recommendations and, um, you know, we looked at the goals and I had some questions about it and the response was, you know, oh, well, you know, they're going to get it, you know, because they're scientists and they understand these things, right? And it's like, well, but we're there for a reason. We don't know that, right? <laughs> we don't know that yet, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, perhaps, but maybe they're not there, you know, like, have you asked them, right? Regardless of their education, regardless of that, like, they're, you know, we're there for a reason. So that might be an example. Oh, so you mean, like, based on the parents' um, socioeconomic background, education, a clinician can walk in there and maybe do a better job if they know that parents are more educated versus parents who they know that would just say yes, yes, yes to anything that's um, suggested to them. Is that what you mean by those biases? Um, yes and no, right? So that's so so that is an example, right? Like, yeah, sometimes practitioners, you know, may go in, right? They might want to do a better job with someone who might be more educated, right? Sometimes you see a practitioner that goes in, maybe, you know, working with a family that does live in an area that maybe, you know, is not a preferred area, not because, you know, it's the family's preference to live in that non preferred area, but right. Oh, you're talking like, like geographically. Geographically, right. Okay. Um, as other examples, um, you know, like, yeah. Uh, you know, some some practitioner may shy away from maybe, you know, providing the best practice, right? And 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 part of that all, you know, comes down to like personal biases or even maybe they learned, you know, I don't know, history of reinforcement. Um, but in all of this is to say that I think that we can do a better job of providing culturally responsive treatment, right? And programming to our families. And so, um, and I, and having said that, I think you know one of the biggest difference also in in our families that we work with um, is that you know they they probably come from a place that maybe I don't know if this might be the word term to use right, but I feel that a lot of the families that I have worked with has come from a place of trauma, right? A trauma because perhaps you know, maybe help wasn't there, maybe they're seeking help, but there's just so many, so many things, right, that is blocking them or in the way of getting services, right? And then finally, when they get services, there's still like all these other things that, you know, that that may block continued services or good services, right, or things like that. And so I feel like a lot of the times, you know, in general, you know, and it may be, you know, that all of our families come from a place of trauma, because it is traumatic, right? Like, you know, you have, you know, you maybe have just learned that your child has a diagnosis of autism or a diagnosis of, you know, anything like any disability or anything like that, like that is traumatic, right? And it's almost like the grief cycle, right? It does, you know, you may be grieving, and then now you have to try to seek services. And now people might be imposing their opinions on you and, and, and all the above, right? And so I think everybody does come from a place of potential trauma, but I do see a lot more in it, maybe our families, um, uh, among families, um, you know, and, and perhaps it could also be that maybe, you know, in addition to the trauma that we may experience with other individuals, right, um, our culture itself, not that they're not accepting, right, um, you know, we know that there are a lot of individual, a lot of families, you know, and it's individualized, right, like, you know, I know a lot of people who are very accepting of services, a lot of people who are accepting of autism, but then we also know that, you know, there's a lot of people that are not accepting of autism, that are not accepting, you know, of services. 
process. And so perhaps, you know, like family dynamics, maybe culture may play, you know, part of it, you know, upbringing, you know, services in general, information that may not have been disseminated or just resources in general that does limit and does, you know, bring some limitation to our understanding um, in terms of, you know, of, of autism in, in our understanding of ABA. It also limits our opportunity for, for services, right, and gaining access to services and, and all the above. Yeah. So, Mary, when I started in the field about, what, 17 years ago, I remember being young and fresh and green and you get training from your, you know, directors on cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, right? Those were the buzzwords back then in the early 2000s. We're so old. Um, and <laughs> then and then the field grows and it evolves and it changes and we are enlightened. We are woke now, okay? And so I went to a CEU this year and they were using words like cultural humility, cultural competence. And our favorite, cultural responsiveness, right? Being culturally responsive. So, um, well, first of all, before, to be a good clinician, we should define that. Um, how would you, de- first of all, define cultural, uh, being culturally responsive? And then how can mom clinicians, you and I, and all of our colleagues, be culturally responsive when providing therapy services, so ABA services, um, and then what are some barriers to understanding what Hmong families expect from Hmong providers? I'm sorry, not just Hmong providers, but service providers in general. Yeah, no, that is, you know, this is such a, a deep question, right? I feel like it's 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 such a deep discussion and I think it deserves, you know, like a lot more attention, right? And, and a lot more continued discussion among our communities. Oh, yeah, it's uh, never ending. It'll keep going until the end of days, but we got to start the conversation. So here we right. are. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. And I think, you know, how can more clinicians be culturally responsive? Um, You know, I think in general, how anyone can be culturally responsive is to come from a place of compassion, right? And that compassionate care and being able to being able to sit and listen to kind of where the family is at, right? So just like we would with, you know, with any intervention, looking at the family's baseline, you know, getting a good understanding of where they're at and working with the family and actually hearing them. So like if I am making a recommendation that maybe the family's not there yet, they're not fully comfortable, right? They haven't heard much information um, about it, or they they can't make an informed decision yet because maybe the, the information that has been provided is just so much for them, giving them that time and space, right, to learn about it, providing some additional information, right, so that they can actually learn about it. Um, you know, checking in with them, you know, ensuring that that they are really informed before they can make an informed decision. And I think that's really important, right? Because I think oftentimes, you know, sometimes as you know, as practitioners, we go in there or sometimes we're always, you know, facing the clock, right? It's like, hey, you have authorization, you have X amount of time to finish this, right? Hey, you know, now you have a medical prescription, you know, I have, you know, this amount of time to work with you. But maybe, maybe we might need to look at asking for an extension because this family still needs time to process. And that's okay, right? That's why we're also there. That's why we should also be there to also advocate for our families, right? And not necessarily just, you know, just tell them, you know, it's, we have to do it by this timeline because, you know, in those circumstances, that might be how you show cultural responsiveness to a family in that moment. And maybe it's just like giving them time, right? So before we even enter the picture, they would have met with our intake team, but even before they met our intake team, someone told them about ABA, whether it directed them to who was available. So like a service coordinator, right? A case manager. And do you feel like then the cultural responsiveness re- responsibility falls on them as well to recognize that this is a Hmong family? They, if, if, even if, I mean, sure, maybe if they are English speaking, then great. But if they're not, then we need to go ahead and get someone here on the team who can thoroughly explain what service they're getting themselves into before they even, before we even show up. Because once we show up, then I feel like we're doing double duty at this point. We're going, okay, so I'm here to do the assessment. Oh, wait, what? You don't know why you're here? 
nobody explained to you, right? And so we're backtracking. And then we have to kind of go in there and justify why we're here, explain why we're here. And we're trying to get buy-in when that should have happened two, two visits ago. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, I think that when we talk about culture, being culturally responsive, it is, it's not just with us, right? It's like the whole system. It's the whole right? system. Absolutely. I mean, right? Yeah, I definitely, and, and I agree. I think it should be the whole system. It should be every individual, every practitioner, every individual that works with any person, right, in terms of providing a system should come from a culturally responsive lens. And I feel like when you do that, you can better a system, right? So if this family is coming to you and saying, hey, here are my concerns, that is also how you're going to match them with the agency, right? You don't just kind of place them, right? So like, hey, my concern is I'm Hmong, you know, the service provider should be looking for agency that might have mom clinicians, right? Um, you know, my concern is that they may not understand, you know, maybe some of my life circumstances. Looking at agencies that maybe have, you know, that experience so that they can support them, right? Um, so definitely. Um, but I, um, so yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I think every, you know, service provider should always come from a culturally responsive lens so that we can always provide, you know, services that is culturally responsive to the family so that we are always trying to meet their needs right because that's why like they have a need and we should try to meet their needs as clinicians yes we all have the same degrees we all have a certification same licensure a lot of us have been in the field for a long time work with a variety of you know in stages of clientele but it astounds me how many of my colleagues my white counterparts Mm -hmm. and I'm not calling anyone out because it's the whole field it's the whole human services field I I have colleagues who are like I don't know what ethnicity they are Mm -hmm. and I'm going I'm going you did their intake did you not ask Mm -hmm. no I'm like I mean in the back of my mind I'm thinking well someone's ethnicity is not just a word or an action or a verb or adjective <laughs> after I think how else you know your ethnicity is more than who you are it's what you are who who you are how you are what you do what you eat how you sleep how you talk how you walk how you everything and to not even ask someone what their ethnicity is like i i was shocked to know that there are a lot of clinicians out there who don't even think that far and that's not even far that's just on the paper that's on the initial intake paper like all you had to do and then it astounded me even more when i said well how long have you been there bcba a year and i thought you've been programming through two authorizations and you don't know their ethnicity and that's when it really shocked me and it woke me up and i thought we've got to talk about this This is not okay. It's not okay to serve a family for through two authorizations for a whole year. You don't know what their ethnicity is. How are you even treatment planning? Are you making success? Are you barely making success? Are you truly seeing this child? Are you truly seeing the family? Are you meeting their needs? And so, you know, it's really, um, it's a wake up call. It was a wake up call for me to realize that um, not everyone's aware of how important that is, you know. Um, so yeah, I hope that's important. Yeah. And you're right. And that is so important because that also comes down to the very basic of, you know, I see that as like respect, right? Playing devil's advocate. I can understand maybe somebody not wanting to know someone's ethnicity or not wanting to ask because they don't want them to feel like maybe they're being judged or et cetera. Right. However, it's, you know, when you're working with a family that may have different dynamics, right, than than you, but also to as a practitioner, it is also as part of our responsibility to understand how to program according to the family dynamics, right? And so like, then when you actually dive into it, it's like, that's really important. You're right, to know who they are, right, to talk about these things. Now, it's one thing to say, hey, you know, like, are you comfortable telling me about your ethnicity? And the family is like, no, then okay, fine, you know, I'll respect that. But, mm-hmm. you know, rarely do I, you know, do do I hear families say like no oftentimes when I ask they're like yes I'm this and they share about the culture and they're like and we do this yeah. and then the, and then that opens up the door like actually you know what like we don't do eye contact because you know we barely like it doesn't matter I don't really make my son like you know stare at somebody right and you're like oh okay, right. cool. you know and these things and that really does goes into like programming and things like that so I think you hit it on to like Tia like that that's a very unfortunate 
It is. But I do see more CEUs talking about, you know, diving into DEI. <laughs> and I hope that we can continue to enlighten each other, right? I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the questions, right? Questions to ask. I just know that based on the feeling, if my child were to go in and nobody ever said, you know, like, what language do you guys speak at home? Or what ethnicity are you? And, and, and right, maybe, you know, they don't want to make anyone to feel special or excluded or anything like that. But, you know, if you're treating the individual then you've got to treat all parts of them right not just yeah. autism I agree um, Tia and I think you know another part to like your question right about like our mom clinicians um something that I just that you know has been kind of like having on my heart right um and so I think maybe this might be just something you know to to have a discussion on is I think as mom clinician I feel like we already have the upper hand simply because we're mom for our other mom families right for some reason, there's that sense of like, oh, they get your name, right? Like, wow, you know, your mom, right? Oh, you know, like I can go and talk to you or, you know, maybe you'll understand me, you know, in terms of services and being service providers. Um, but it's also so having on my heart, like when I hear stories about like, oh, yeah, well, they're Hmong. And then also, too, they may not be providing the best services, right? Simply because they're Hmong and it's like I can chip you, you know, it's like, hey, you know, I'm a Hmong clinician. And so you come here, but you know what? But like, you know, maybe, maybe you don't really need the service or, okay, great. I'm just going to hook you up with this agency and then not follow up with you, right? Or touch base with you. So for example, I had a family who had reached out to me about just some services and we talked about it and I was like, you know, talking to them about like the regional center and how we have Hmong providers there, right? Like Hmong service coordinators. And if they don't have one, maybe that may be really cool to like, you know, um, to be able to request for a Hmong service provider, right? So they can actually help them through, you know, these services because they, they know these services. Um, and the family was just like, you know, well, we have a Hmong service provider, but then, you know, they don't check up on us when we ask them. And when I bring my concerns, they're just like, you know, they say that they will get back to me, but they don't, you know, and, and that makes me really sad, right? And so when we talk about, you know, culturally responsiveness, and maybe having cultural responsiveness, I think that we also have, in general, right, as a practitioner, I think that we should always come from that lens. But I think that we should always also be a very responsible practitioner, right, to be able to provide that. So when we talk about like, how can our Hmong clinicians, right? Like what can our Hmong families accept from service providers? Sometimes I feel that some Hmong families are really excited when they hear that we have Hmong professionals out there. And then sometimes I feel that a lot of Hmong individuals, especially younger generations, are like, let's stay away from them because they're not accepting, right? Because they're not going to help me truly. And I don't know where that discrepancy is. I don't know where, you know, their learned history reinforcement falls Oh, wait, on. the younger generation of, of clients. Hmong clients are the ones saying, let's stay away from the practitioners? Yeah, like, let's, let's stay away from away. service providers? Well, in my experience, right, like the younger generations are like, you know, let's stay away from, you know, like more practitioners, they may not be as helpful, um, you know, they may not take us seriously, um, you know, and things like that. Because and so, they have bad experiences with previous clinicians who did a poor job? Yes, yes. Right. And I think, you know, and, and this is not to call out any like mom clinician or practitioner, like I know that there are, you know, bad services provider out there, right? Who is not mom, right? And we encounter that all the time. But I think, you know, that because I am mom, right? And so sometimes like I expect that, you know, yeah, mom, who mom. And so, you know, I, I think maybe also too, right? Talk about personal biases. My personal bias is that, yes, if we're a mom, we should try to help each other, right? Because, you know, when I think about that perspective of like, you know, this person has been trying to find services for a while and maybe no one has, you know, maybe tried to understand them. They're trying to find somebody that may understand them. So maybe now they've come and they finally found somebody who may understand them or who they assume may understand them, who's mom, right? Like, I feel like we should, I mean, with everybody as well, right? But then that we should, you know, spend the time to really help our mom families, right? And that's also my personal biases. But, you know, again, having said that, like, yes, I understand there are other clinicians who's not mom who does the same thing, right? And so it's not just mm -hmm. calling our mom, our mom clinicians. But this is just to say that, you know, right? And so when we are growing 
profession is growing, right? We have more doctors, we have more psychologists, we have more, you know, behavior analysts, we have more teachers. We, I mean, our, we're, you know, we're, we've grown, right? We have, you know, we have, we have a field. I mean, we, we're in almost all the fields, right? Um, that cultural responsiveness, you know, is still the responsibility of, of all clinicians, right? I think there are two camps. I think there are that one where they've had a bad experience, right? With a monk clinician, they're like, oh, forget about them, right? They're all going to screw us over. And then I feel like there are there's another camp of the ones who are like, you know what? I would prefer not to have a monk clinician because then I don't have to deal with being known. I can be, you know, incognito. I don't have to deal with the cultural expectations of, you know, having to be polite, right? Because yeah, then you can just be like, oh, he's a service provider. Um, and then when you have a monk clinician, you might feel like, oh, I have to put on my monk hat and, you know, uh, hula, you know, invite them, be courteous, put, you know, put on my monk party hat and all this stuff. And then it's like, what is this? So I'm curious to know if that happens um, often. And, and it's just like, it's easy just to bypass that. And then it also comes down to awareness, you know, um, you know, maybe it's unfortunate that you've had um, poor services, but, you know, awareness of having a great BCBA who comes in there and looks at your family with those cultural responsiveness lens and then also can do a kick-ass job. So mm-hmm. hopefully we're aiming for that, right? Yeah. We're moving towards that aim. as we grow. So Mary, you know, we've had this conversation since day one about the lack of a term for autism Hmong, okay? And I still get asked, I, I want to educate the Hmong people in my area too. Uh, how do we, what do we say for autism? I was like, autism? <laughs> there isn't yes. a word. I'm, yeah. I'm not here to coin a word. I'm not, that's not my job. That's not what I'm here to do. You know, like, in fact, I don't know that we will ever do that. So, you know, a lot of parents, professionals have asked if, when, who will coin a term for autism Hmong? Um, we've talked about this in our group. We've talked about this amongst ourselves. What is your opinion on doing so? And what are the benefits of doing so? I don't think that it would be harmful to do so. So let's just talk about what is your opinion on doing so. And then, you know, what do we gain out of it? If we were to come up with a Hmong word for autism? Yeah. So personally, um, I don't think that we should coin a term in Hmong for autism. I think that it's really important to desensitize our community to the term autism because it is the term that is going to kind of be like universally used, right? It's the most, mo- it, it's it's known, right? Services are, we have I mean, the most services for autism, right? So when you think about that and about how to access services and how to, you know, maybe know about autism and disseminating information and stuff, knowing the term autism is a desensitizing our community to it is probably going to be beneficial for them, right? So when they say, hey, autism services here, autism focus group, like get this, you have autism, they're going to like, those are things that they know that they can access. Um, And so I don't think that we should term that, but also too, like when they hear it, they will recognize it and they will know it. In general, right? Change is really hard. You know, we have so many things in that we're moving towards acceptance, right? But we're still very at the very basic of like, you know, yeah, let's talk about autism. You know, there is a growth in autism, you know, while we're getting services, like what is this? And we're still just so many information. I just think about like, if we're going to try to coin a term autism, you know how hard that's going to be, right? Like, Actually, it's really easy. I I read that um, the Somali community in Minnesota did coin a term for autism in their language. Yeah. I don't know how successful it has been, but it's doable. I just don't know that. I don't know if the Hmong community, the Hmong autism community is ready for that or if there really is a need. Right, right. No, absolutely. And I've heard that too. And they, they, they have coined a term, right, in, in, um, in terms of autism. But I don't know that they're actually using that universally, right? So it could right, just be like course. a group, just kind of like all of the different like more religions out there, right? Like, hey, now we have all these different more religion, all these different, you know, um, you know, and and that's okay. You can totally do that. But you know, is it going to be used universal, like you know, in terms of like a, new, a universal term for our community? And so, I mean, that's my stance. I feel that you know, in terms in terms of when you look at it from the perspective of gaining services, understanding services, and et cetera, knowing that term, being able to recognize that term will allow them to access services, um, you know, a lot more in the community, right? 
And that also goes with like, you know, translation and interpretation, right? Like we don't, right now, as we know, like translation is still, we barely have translations of text in terms of like when it comes to like autism or, you know, I mean, disability in general, it's, you know, it's, we're, we're doing better, but we don't yet. And so imagine if you start to coin a term of autism and everything's now translated, right? And not everybody is going to be educated in that this term is going to equals autism, like, you know, how weird is that, right? Or like, how are you going to recognize or like, what term is that? And now you're going to have to explain extra what that is. And so right. I mean, that's well, just, you know, where I stand. Yeah, speaking of that, that kind of is segue to my next question. And of course, I never had to use any of this as references for anything that I did in terms of, you know, in grad school and or in real life. Um, but I, you know, it wasn't until we started, uh, what all two years ago that we really looked at, you know, starting in a, our own initiative and doing that translation as far as medical terminology goes. And we found a few and we realized how outdated they were, right? And that I've spoken about this before that, you know, science is beautiful in that it's ever changing, that it's allowed to be ever changing and, uh, how we understand it, how we interpret it, how we apply it to how, humans are changing is great currently existing literature out there needs some updating i'd like for it to be more person centered person forward i'm looking at a specific website and it's a edu.edu page and their definition um for autism in home the white dialect is gay hai lu mo thing ming right mm-hmm. and it's like Okay, well, if you say that to an individual that has no idea what autism is, and they go and they find this glossary and they, oh, oh, autism, you know that. But that's so not all encompassing at all. So, yeah, Mary, how do we remedy this? And who does this task fall on? Every single, you know, like, um, dot edu group out there that's like hey let's put a list of monks to get together and let's revisit this. Like, are they the ones tasked with it? Or do just public citizens who are passionate about this say hey we're gonna put up a new one you know because if we talk about the lack of a term for autism so fine we don't have one but we're gonna define it we need to define it in a way that is one fair two you know is all encompassing of all the things that you and i know you know when we look at the literature how do we come up with uh, with this medical terminology that better you know explains and um, defines what is autism yeah. And I think, you know, like, um, you know, when I, I don't necessarily, okay, so I wouldn't necessarily say that the mode terminology is outdated. So for, for like, like, the example that you provided, um, I do think, right, in general, that Hmong has limited terminology, right? So I don't think that it's outdated. I just think that translation has done is is done poorly, right? Like we can absolutely translate like autism with the characteristics of autism quite differently, you know? And so it's not sure, that it's yeah. outdated, but then it's just, it's not translated like correctly, right? Like when I hear yeah. that- well, like, I meant outdated as in maybe that was like the initial understanding way back in the 60s, oh, perhaps, mm-hmm. right? That's how people would have maybe, you know, oh, autism, you know, they can't communicate. But then now we know that, you know, it's not that, right? We have plenty of right. individuals with autism who can communicate. So it's outdated in that respect. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. So I would agree. But I think a beautiful thing about Hmong, right, is that we often get to explain or describe things, right? And we can't change our language, right? Because I don't, I, and we shouldn't. Um, but I think, you know, again, like what we should do instead is work how to describe, because our language is is very descriptive, right? That's just, that's just, you know, that's, that's a beautiful part of, of Hmong. And I think that we should work or strive to really describe all, like medical terminology in a better way. And, you know, whose hat does that fall on? Individuals who are, you know, who's translating, right? And But then I think the hard part about that is that, you know, like we don't even know, you know, these individuals that translate. Sometimes these translation agencies just kind of, you know, like pay, you know, inquire, and then someone says, I can do Hmong, and then they just pay them and they do the job. And maybe there's not even a person that oversees that translation, right? Because, you know, I don't even know how many translators or or interpreters are out there, right? And and so they're not doing their due diligence in getting like, you know, feedback from the community, from people who speak the language, looking at it from the educational, scientific, other input, they're just putting translations out there based on, you know, yeah, right? I mean, because you hire a translator, you assume that they are competent as being a translator, right? So, you know, I think sometimes... So then right? is it fair to say that their translations are not culturally responsive, culturally competent? 
Yes, absolutely. Right. Gotcha. We, and we know that there are trans, some translators who aren't culturally, you know, competent or, you know, in that matter as well. Mm-hmm. Right. So, for example, I remember looking at a document. I don't remember where I want to say somewhere in Minnesota where it was almost like an application to like um, some disability or mental health office. And, you know, they translated the term, you know, like female or male and they translated the, the, the terminology female as male. Right. And so it's like, okay, like I understand, right? When you talk about I'm sorry, like, back up. What did you say? Mal. They translated itu female as mal. Yes, right? As in, as in, <laughs> like you would say mode, like that. And it was published? And it was published, yes. So mal, as in like almost just like, you know, a female animal, right? But then when you think about mm-hmm. it, it's like, of course, like, you know, you could have translated that differently, right? And I mm-hmm. don't know who the... In- the translator was right maybe yeah. in their mind yeah mal does me female in some sort oh. of aspect right and okay. that's fine um but maybe not the right terminology in this context right mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you know like yeah like they're you know so who's responsible it is it's going to be you know are the individuals who are translators and who who are putting themselves out there as you know you know as translators like it they should be, you know, doing their due diligence and, you know, really talking to the community, improving their skills as well, right? Just because you speak and can write Hmong doesn't necessarily mean you can, you know, translate, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it, there, it's there's, there's right. a skill to it, you know? Um, so I think was it a year ago? I, I feel like it was before I went on maternity leave last year. Our Otho um, administrators, we got together and it was a project, right, that we had one of our uh, moderators start um, as far as doing uh, medical terminology and even amongst our small group of what, five of us, we discovered that, hey, we all speak some variation of Hmong, some we have some literacy when it comes to speaking Hmong. We needed help with spelling it, but even we speak differently, right? Like yeah. how we would phrase something. It was so different and we had to come to a consensus and even that was like hard. So, yeah, I can see why it's hard for whoever was tasked to do this to be like, like you need a lawsuit they just print it you know so it happens but you know definitely i'd love to see updated um medical terminology and i think with that comes with you know um awareness education um and all of that so mary this is my last and final question for you i know um we kind of you know continue to do our work in our respective areas right you on the west coast i'm in the midwest but you know our common ground is the Hmong autism community so you know we started this group a few years ago and we see i know i've heard a lot of positive feedback you know people who are like i i wish this would have existed 10 years ago when you know my my kid was a toddler and and then we have parents who join and who are you know, they, they needed this. They needed to hear and see stories from people that look like them. Like, how powerful is that, you know, that they have that? And it's amazing that we are able to create that for them. Um, and so what do you hope to see happen in the Hmong autism community in the decades to come? Yeah, you know, I would hope that the larger community would find ways to support our families, right? I think that that's one of my biggest hope. Um, I hope that service, like service providers will seek understanding about our culture, right? And provide culturally responsive treatment and programming. You know, I would hope that our community would be, you know, open to trying different types of services, right? And understanding of these services um, and to be supportive of of individuals that are getting services. Um, I think sometimes we share our supports, you know, in we express supports um, differently. And so I feel like sometimes, you know, it may come off as not being very supportive, right? Um, and I, and so I think that, you know, I, I would hope that, you know, we would try to show compassion when we are trying to support our families, right? And so, you know, maybe not, you know, because sometimes I feel like, you know, people feel like if I don't say anything, I'm supporting them. But maybe because you're not saying anything also shows that maybe you're not supporting them, right? Because language is awkward. What do you mean by that? By not saying anything, I'm supporting them because I'm keeping their secret. I'm keeping their, I'm being, I'm being, you know, I'm, they can confide in me that they have this, 
life changing thing going on, but because Gucci had it and protecting their, you know, the fact that their child has an autism. Is that what you mean by I don't say anything and it helps to support them? Well, you know, yeah, I mean, that, so that can be an example, right? But I was thinking more about like, you know, maybe if you have a family member who does have autism and they're receiving services, right? And your family member is, you know, is obviously seeking support and services, but then you just, you know, you don't like show any feeling towards it, right? Like you don't say anything, you know, about it. Um, and I, I think it makes because it you're, a Because you're being respectful by not because showing any feelings towards yes. it? Yes. Right, right. Okay. And I think that okay. sometimes it's like, you know, I people say that, you know, sometimes the best, you know, response is silence. And I feel like when someone is seeking services or because one, it's so hard to seek services, right? And receiving mm-hmm. services and accepting services is also very hard, right? And so you yeah. imagine like, you know, this is kind of where, you know, when you talk about like building capacity and family members and support, like maybe sometimes silence is not the best response, right? In these instances, right? You know, like not saying anything, not showing any emotions because sometimes maybe that's what they need maybe in that moment they're just needing you to validate and say hey I'm glad you got services right or like you know let me know how I can help right or even like you know can I you know can can I buy something right for services something simple like that you know rather than just kind of like silence you know almost like if I don't say that's the one way Mary that's the one way (laughs) we show our love and our support by (laughs) right but then like that's just a stark contrast between our Hmong culture our Hmong Hmong isms and then we put on our our BCBA hat we're all like hey let me show you all the things there's so many things i can show you and how can i support you come out to the walk you know let's talk about this right and so that's where we come in and we straddle that and we go oh okay they are supportive they're just showing it in a different way (laughs) right right and i think that's why right that's why i hope that in the future our mom community can can be more supportive in that way right so maybe not stay so silent. in a more expressive way in a more, more vocal way, way. Yes. gotcha no more vocal way no more expressive way however that they can um but i also think you know that as we get older right i hope to i hope that we can set the examples for our children right to be knowledgeable of autism to be accepting of autism right and that our mm-hmm. children's children and also to that you know that if our children's you know, and 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 the reason for that is obviously, you know, to, if we start now to desensitize our community, right, to autism, I know that it's probably going to be, you know, when I pass me or so that my daughter then will know and likely, you know, be more desensitized to autism and be more accepting and it will follow through, right? And so then the hope is that, you know, to, to, to have more of that acceptance and that awareness and for them to know that, hey, it's okay, right? It's okay. You know, they have autism. That's okay. You know, can um, you define for me and mom and for our mom listeners what the word desensitize means? Yeah, so I oh my goodness, Tia, that is a very hard question. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so desensitize would mean, um, you know, for us to be able. How, how? Well, you know, just kind of like how it's really hard to define it with another word, right? We, we just explain the heck out of it. So to desensitize to me would mean like when uh, and we, I talk about my job, they don't dismiss what I do. They know that when I talk about autism, they're like, oh, autism, you know, Beijing Chai, autism When they hear autism, they're not like, oh, shut down. I don't want to talk about this. Right? They're like, oh, they're accepting. It is attached to positive thoughts, happy thoughts, support. Supportive thoughts, right? Not, oh, don't, don't, let's be quiet. Let's not talk about it because I'm uncomfortable now, right? So That's desensitizing true. our own community would be like anybody and everybody can have these conversations all the time, anytime, and it's normal and it's okay and it's encouraging and it's loving and it's caring and supportive. That's what I think about when I think about desensitizing our home community. Yes, absolutely. And I think you, exactly, exactly just that, right? Being able to talk about it and, and be comfortable. And I think, and, and I think, you know, you had offered there like being comfortable, right? With mm-hmm. it, right? Being comfortable, you yep. know, with the terminology and being okay with it. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for okay. your insights and your experience and all the amazing things you have done for all of your families. Um, I'm really, really glad that we randomly met two years ago and have started this whole movement. I know that was your main thing. And now I hope to see that other that we can hopefully stoke a fire in our Hmong community and start continuing the movement because eventually one day Mary will be working for the FBI doing, <laughs> you know, profiling and I will be hopefully doing OBM stuff and we will need people who are still working in the autism population, <laughs> make, doing miracles every day and still continue to work at Gosh, girl, we got 25 more years to go, right? So yeah. I hope that in the next 25 years, we'll have another um, generation of Hmong uh, BCBAs come through and they will be talking about acceptance. But right now, yeah. I'm here for awareness. We are here for awareness. And thank you for helping me bring awareness to the Hmong community. Absolutely. Thank you, Tia. Thanks for all that you yes. do. You know, keep doing what you do because we need more of you. Thank you.